uh, received an email uh, this morning saying, when I was a young boy, I met Odd Nansen several times at my parents' house. For me, Nansen was the link to a reality just 10 to 15 years earlier, filled with so much cruelty and suffering. I wish I could have come to Villa Grande today, but I'm looking forward very much to reading the book. Best regards from Nils Butenschön, uh, for many years director at the Norwegian Center for Human Rights. But my name is Kari Amdam, and I work here at the Holocaust Center. I also have warm greetings for you from the director at our center, uh, Mrs. Guri Geltnes. This is a joint event between Norway's Resistance Museum and the Holocaust Center. We are very happy to see you here again, Mr. Timothy Boyce. You are a true friend and a generous sponsor of our two institutions. Mr. Frode Farai, a historian at the Resistance Museum, will now take care of the introduction. Thank you, Kari. <clears throat> Some of the most popular stories published shortly after the liberation in May 1945 were accounts from war heroes who had excelled in the active parts of the Norwegian resistance, like Max Manus and Osbjorn Sunde. However, the vast majority of the Norwegian writers representing this first flaw of memorial literature, which in different ways depicts the struggle for freedom, were neither aviators, special agents, nor saboteurs. In Instead, they had in fact spent much of the occupation, occupation behind the walls and barbed wires of German prisons and concentration camps. Within this category of memorial contributions from people who all were branded by the Nazi regime, I will estimate that the total number of publications only for the first five post-war years is close to 100. A, signif a, sin a significant number of these authors could rely on some personal records during their imprisonment. But only a few books, a few of the books were based on the daily experience and impressions and thus can be characterized as real diaries. Two of these early published books became bestsellers. The most famous of them is probably the diary of Petter Moon. Moon, who perished on a prisoner transport to Germany in September 1944. Another most remarkable account was Odd Nansen's diaries from day to day. Already published in 1946, his notes formed three volumes and covered nearly 1,000 pages. And a few years later was available in both English and German editions. The name of Odd Nansen is closely connected to his more famous father, Fritjof Nansen. As a young and socially engaged architect, Odd Nansen wanted to take up the humanitarian legacy of his father. And in 1936, he founded the Nansen Relief, a small but highly effective aid organization just before the outbreak of World War II, the Nansen Relief engaged in the rescue of 260 refugees, of which a large proportion were Jews. 
They were all fleeing the Nazi rule areas of Germany, Austria, and Czechoslovakia. Today, we will concentrate on Od Nansen's life during World War II, and we will primarily focus on his record as a political prisoner at Grini and Sachsenhausen. Our dear guest, who has come all the way from North Carolina to pull Odd Nansen's diaries out of oblivion, is Timothy Boyce. Tim practiced law for many years as the managing partner in a lawyer's office in Charlotte, North Carolina. He holds an MBA from the Wharton School of Finance and a GD from the University of Pennsylvania Law School. He also received a BS in Foreign Service from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. In 2014, Tim retired to devote full time for his writing and the upcoming new release of the Old Nansen Diary, which he completed two years later. This impressive and quite heavy edition, <laughs> I now hold in my left hand, we look much forward to an exciting lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Timothy Boyce. Thank you very much for the introduction. I assume you can all hear me? Okay, great, great. Well, thank you for coming out today. We've got standing room in the back. I was told that if it was sunny day in Oslo, maybe nobody would come. So I appreciate your coming and allowing me to share this story with you. I have to admit that I am somewhat intimidated to be standing here in front of all of you today. You know, when I give this presentation in America, I can say pretty much anything about Norway, and no one's going to contradict me. But I realize today I am speaking to the, to the A-team. My very dear friend, Marit, is sitting here. Marit is Aunt Nansen's eldest daughter. We have my friend, Robert Bjorka. Robert, it, when I asked him his age, he said he was this close to 100. So that's pretty close. And Robert was in Sachsenhausen with Aunt Nansen. We have the biographer of Ad Nansen, Anna Ellingsen. She's, I know she's sitting, oh, there she is in the second row. And we have our historian, Froda. So I know we have some, some um, special guests here, and I'll try to make sure I, I uh, do a good job in my presentation. In order to begin talking about Nansen, what I would like to do actually is enlist some participation from each of you. What I'd like to do is a little bit of role playing with you. I'd like you all to imagine that you are once again 10 years old. If Robert Bjorka, who's this close to 100, can remember when he was 10 years old, all of you can do that, right? And imagine now that you are 10 years old, and instead of waking up in a nice soft bed, in a nice cozy house, in a place like Oslo, or Stavanger, or Bergen, or in my case, New Haven, Connecticut, which is where I was born and raised, imagine that you are 10 years old, and you are waking up in a concentration camp, a concentration camp called Auschwitz. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. And the date is January 1945. The guards have just come into your barracks, and they're screaming and shouting and bellowing the command, Raus, Raus, that's a German for out, everyone out. We're evacuating the camp. So you line up outside your barracks, and you join a marching column that at this point is already miles long. You slowly make your way out to the front gate and onto these back roads. And for the next three days, you march in the snow, in ice, in mud, in slush, in bitterly, bitterly cold temperatures, as only January in Eastern Europe can be like. I'm sure you have some pretty bitter cold uh, winters in January here as well. And then on the third day, you reach a railhead. And at that point, you're put on an open cattle car. You got four sides, no roof, no heat, no protection from the elements. And you spend the next 10 days in that cattle car as this train slowly makes its way out of southwestern Poland, 
takes a long detour through Czechoslovakia, and finally turns north into Germany and comes to a stop at another concentration camp, a camp called Sachsenhausen. It's located about 25 miles or about 40 kilometers north of Berlin. And when you get there, you're grateful that you're still alive. Thousands of people died in that two-week period in what became known in history as the Auschwitz Death March. They froze to death, they were shot if they couldn't keep up the pace, they died of exposure, whatever. But as I say, you're one of the lucky ones who made it. In fact, one out of every four prisoners who left Auschwitz on that death march never made it to their destination alive. But that doesn't mean the fact that you've made it to Sachsenhausen doesn't mean that you're not suffering as well by this point. It doesn't mean you're not hurting. By the time you get to Sachsenhausen, you have such terrible pains in both of your feet that you can barely walk. You can barely walk into the camp under your own power. But up until now, you dare not take off your boots to see what's wrong with your feet, to see what the source of this pain is for a variety of reasons, including the fear that if you take off your boots, somebody will steal them. By January 1945, it is a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and people are prepared to do just about anything to try to stay alive. But now that you're in Sachsenhausen, you take off your boots to see what's wrong with your feet, what the source of this pain is that you have, and your feet no longer look like the palm of my hand. They're no longer flesh-colored. They've turned completely black. Black from a severe case of frostbite. In fact, so severe that some of the flesh on your toes is already starting to rot. So you know you have to go to the infirmary. You know you have to get medical attention. The infirmary, the German word for the infirmary is the Revier. You know you have to go there. I mean, that's the logical thing to do. That's what you and I would do. When we get sick, we see a doctor and we get treated. But in the crazy, upside-down, illogical world of the concentration camp, the Revier was actually considered one of the most dangerous places you could go. The prisoners called it the waiting room for the gas chamber. Because if you think about it, if you're lying in a hospital bed, you're not working. And if you're not working in the camp, you're not contributing to the camp, what's the point of wasting resources on you? The answer is not much. But you also know that if you don't get medical attention, you're going to get gangrene. And once you've got gangrene, you are as pretty much as good as dead at that point. So you screw up your courage, you report to the infirmary, and luckily for you that day, there was a kindly doctor on duty. It was a fellow prisoner, not a Nazi doctor. In fact, he was a Norwegian named Sven Oftedal. And he takes one look at your feet, he asks you to lay down on an, on an examining table, and with a signal that he gives, four adults come out, they, put, they hold your arms and legs down, he gives you a whiff of ether to knock you out, and the next thing you know, you're waking up in a hospital bed, you look down, both your feet now are heavily bandaged, and the orderlies explain to you that Dr. Oftedal had to amputate some of your toes to try to save your feet. And now that you're lying in this bed, wondering to yourself probably, you know, how long can I stay in a hospital bed in the Revier before some Nazi doctor walks in and says, what's a 10-year-old child using up a hospital bed for? You know what to do with somebody like that. You know, we need to make room for more prisoners here. While those thoughts are, are circulating in your head, prisoners are coming into the infirmary you know, almost all the time. And none of them are paying any attention to you at all. I mean, after all, they don't know who you are. They're not, you're not from their village. You're not a relative of theirs. You're just some strange kid who just recently showed up from Auschwitz. And the number one rule is you look out for yourself. You don't worry about other people. You're just trying to survive. You don't worry about, certainly don't worry about strangers who you don't even know. But then, one day, a middle-aged man walks into the infirmary. Instead of walking right by your bed and ignoring you like everyone else has, this person stops. He can speak to you in your language. He can speak German. So he asks you, child, where did you come from? What's your name? Do you know where your parents are anymore? Do you have any friends here? Do you have any siblings? In other words, unlike any other prisoner, at least this one person is showing some interest in you and in your situation. Now, why am I telling you this story in the first place? Well, the first reason is that that's a true story. The young 10-year-old was a boy named Thomas Bergenthal. That's a picture taken of Tommy in 1938. He's all of four years old in that picture. 
And he would spend from September 1939, the very beginning of World War II, until the end of the war as a captive of the Nazis for no other reason other than the fact that he was a Jew. And the person who stopped in the Revier to talk to him was Ad Nansen. Now the second reason why I'm telling you this story is that that chance meeting between these two people ended up changing both of their lives. And when I say this is a chance meeting, most of the prisoners who left Auschwitz were not sent to Sachsenhausen. They were sent to camps that were closer to uh, Auschwitz. Why Tommy was put on the train that was sent to Sachsenhausen, who knows why. When Nansen met uh, Tommy, he met him by, he was, Nansen was going into the Revier to visit one of his Norwegian friends. But there were actually four infirmaries, Revier 1, 2, 3, and 4 in Sachsenhausen. And it just so happened that Tommy, when he was recovering, was in Revier number 3, and that's where Nansen's friend was. And that's the only reason why they bumped into each other. So I said it changed both their lives. In Tommy's case, it literally meant the difference between life and death. Because from that day forward, from the day of that meeting, Nansen used his food and tobacco rations to bribe the orderlies in that hospital ward so that they would protect Tommy, so that they would look out for him. They would make sure that his name did not show up on the selection list of prisoners who were being sent off to the gas chamber periodically. Now, some of you may know this, but some of you may not know how could Nansen be giving away food and tobacco in these concentration camps? I mean, most people would think everybody is starving in the camp. How could he survive if he's giving away food? But that's not really a, a completely accurate picture of what life in these large concentration camps was like. To understand this, what you have to understand is the way the Nazis viewed the world. And that was through the lens of race. To them, race explained how the world really worked. And race also guided how they would treat the world. And in what they called their Weltanschung, their worldview, of course, the Nazis believed that they belonged to the Aryan Nordic race, the superior race, the Hedenvolk, the master race that was going to rule this new world order in Europe that they were trying to create. At the bottom of the totem pole, the Nazis put, of course, the Jews, who they considered to be racially untermenschen, subhuman, fit for nothing other than ultimate extermination. But the Nazis had to find a place, a pecking order for all the races, we would call them nationalities, so they would know how to deal with them. And the way the Nazis viewed the Scandinavians, both the Norwegians and the Danish prisoners, was that in some ways they were racially akin to the Germans. They weren't Aryan, but they were Nordic. After all, you know, you're tall, blonde-haired, blue-eyed. That kind of fits the, Nor the, the Aryan ideal. So the Nazis had a pretty exalted uh, opinion of the Scandinavians, and as a result, they allowed them one benefit in the camp that they did not allow to anybody else, and that is they allowed them to receive food parcels from the Red Cross. And if you had food in a concentration camp where everybody else is starving, then you're rich. You can get anything you want. You get a better, get a, uh, better clothing. You can bribe your way out of being punished, even if you break the rules. Usually when I give a presentation, the first question at the end of the talk is always, almost invariably, somebody says, how did Nazen get his hands on paper to write this diary? And I say to them, look, getting your hands on paper is easy when you've got food. In fact, there was a brothel operating inside of Sachsenhausen. You can get sex as long as you had food. So Nansen had the wherewithal to help Tommy stay alive. Now, I said a few minutes ago that this chance meeting changed both their lives. Now, there really isn't much that, odd not, that Tommy Bergenthal could do to help Ad Nansen. I mean, Tommy's 10 years old, he's got amputated toes, he's in the infirmary. But I think if you read Nansen's diary, I think you have to come to the conclusion, reading between the lines, that by the spring of 1945, that Ad Nansen was heading for a mental breakdown. The tone of his diary entries are getting more and more distressed. It seems like the war just will never end. He thought the war was going to end in 42. Then he was convinced the war was going to end in 1943. The war just kept going on and on. And so the tone of his, of his writings, as I say, is more distressed. And this is what Nansen wrote about meeting Tommy. He didn't write this in his diary. He wrote this in a separate book that he published, uh, actually here in Norway, called Tommy. Some of you may be familiar with that. And he wrote in it, Everywhere I went in the camp, Tommy's angelic face popped up. Without suspecting it, Tommy accomplished with us a work of salvation, 
he touched something in us which was about to disappear. He called to life again human feelings, which were painful to have, but which nevertheless meant salvation for us all. So I think Tommy gave Nansen kind of a reason to keep going during those last few difficult months in 1945. Now, the third reason why I'm telling you this story is that that chance meeting between these two people changed my life completely as well. I never thought I'd be standing in front of an audience in Norway. Um, so, and in, in order to, and of course, I wasn't alive in 1945, and it would take about 60 years for this event to intersect with my life and change it forever. And although Freud mentioned that my career was practicing law, I really felt almost my entire life that I was really a frustrated historian. I love reading history whenever I get a chance. Biographies, memoirs, I like to read about real people and the challenges they've gone through. So whenever I have a chance to go to a bookstore, I always go right to the history section. And I've only been in Oslo for 24 hours, but I've already been in the Norley bookstore um, in, in downtown Oslo. And so I go right to the history section to see what new books there are. And back in the year 2010, so we're going back nine years ago now, I wandered into a bookstore in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I saw this new book that had just been published, a book called A Lucky Child, written by somebody named Thomas Bergenthal. <clears throat> I had never seen the book before, I never heard of the book, it had just been published. And what caught my eye, it's a little bit fuzzy here, but what caught my eye was the subtitle of this book, A Memoir of Surviving Auschwitz as a Young Boy. I thought to myself, a memoir of anybody surviving Auschwitz has got to be an amazing story. How could a child possibly have survived in Auschwitz? So I ended up buying this book really on an impulse, just on the basis of this cover. By the way, this is a picture taken of Tommy after he's been liberated in 1945. He's now 11 years old in that picture. And at this point, he has spent more than 50% of his entire life as a prisoner of the Nazis. <clears throat> So I took this book home, started reading it, and I learned the story that I just related to you. How Nansen, or rather how Bergenthal ends up in Auschwitz, how he takes part in the evacuation, his feet are frostbitten during the transit, he ends up uh, in the infirmary, he meets Nansen, and Nansen intervenes with these food for these bribes and saves his life. And at that point in Tommy's book, he says, by the way, this, this fellow Nansen who saved my life, the man who I credit with keeping me alive, he kept a diary. And then he adds just this one little footnote on the bottom of page 177. You can all read it for yourself, I think. It's pretty clear. Describing what this diary was. Talking about how it came out in Norway and then translated into both English and German. And what's surprising to me when I look at this, this footnote now is not what's in it, but what's not in the, in the footnote. Tommy Bergenthal doesn't say, this diary is a really good book. You ought to go out and buy it. He doesn't say, although obviously he feels that way, he doesn't say that when this book came out in America in 1949, it got fantastic reviews. New York Times, the New York Herald Tribune, Time Magazine, they all called it a masterpiece. All he does is give the facts. But just on the basis of just reading this footnote, I decided, well, maybe this diary would be an interesting book to read. I mean, the bar to get me to buy and read another history book is pretty low. That's the easy part. So I thought to myself, well, since this book has been out of print now for 60 years, I'm not going to find it, of course, in a, in a new bookstore, but we know today that everything in the world that's available for sale can be found where? On the internet. Everything you can find it. So I do a search on the internet for a copy of this book. I am able to locate one single copy of the English version of this book for sale in the entire United States one single copy of this book existed in all of the United States for sale. I found two more in Great Britain for sale, one in Australia, one in New Zealand. Five in the world. I mean, I think there's more copies of Gutenberg's Bible for sale on the internet than there were copies of this book. So I ordered one of them. I bought the, from the bookseller in New Zealand because that was in the best condition. And when it got to me, I looked at it and I thought, this is a pretty big book. Um, and I'm already in the middle of reading some other book. So maybe the way I'll attack this is I'll just start reading one diary entry every night before I go to bed, which is when I did most of my reading. I was still working at the time. And that way I'll, I'll feel like I'll be reading it as he's writing it from day to day. And I did that for about a week. And then one night I, I got in bed and I, I thought to myself, you know, this fellow was in prison for three and a half years. At the rate I'm reading this book, this would be the longest book 
I've ever read in my entire life. I just hope I'm still alive in three and a half years to see how this book actually ends. But you know, I can cut that reading time in half by reading two diary entries every night. So I started reading two. After about another week, I'd read my two diary entries and something was about to happen. I think Nansen was going to get in trouble or his wife, Cotty, was going to come visit him. And I thought to myself, well, I can't stop at two. I I've got to read the next day and find out what happened. So I'll give myself permission to read three diary entries every night. And you can see the slippery slope that I was rapidly sliding down. I got to the point where I put the other book I was reading away. I never finished it. And I just I got hooked. I, I just could not put this diary down. I'd carry it around the house with me. I'd bring it to the breakfast table. I'd be ignoring my wife when she was trying to talk to me. I'd go into my law office in the morning, and I'd say to my secretary, listen, I am working on a really important project this morning. I don't want any calls, no visitors. Leave me alone. I have to concentrate. And of course, what I was doing was reading this book. And before I'd even finished it, before I'd even gotten to the end of it, this thought kept occurring to me. How can it be that this book, which I think is one of the most magnificent books I have ever read in my life, how can it be that no one else has reprinted this book in six decades? I mean, every time you go to, a new, to the bookstore, there's always books that are coming out about World War II. How, does this, how is this one being missed? And I don't know the answer to that, to that conundrum, other than the fact that if you've only got five copies available for sale in the world, the chances of anybody even finding this book and then buying it, reading it, and deciding to do something about it is pretty darn small statistically. I mean, with my one purchase, I've already cornered 20% of the market. You know, now there's only four copies available on the internet. So I decided I would get this book back into print. I really had no idea what I was about to embark on because I have no background in the publishing industry, no contacts in the publishing industry. And I really thought maybe it would take me six months, 12 months, you know, maybe 18 months to get this project done. Well, it ended up taking me six years until 2016 to, to do that. And part of that was because, number one, I, as I admitted, I really didn't know what I was doing most of the time. I was making lots of foolish mistakes. But the other reason is that the more I became interested in Odd Nansen in this book, and the more I started doing research about him, I became even more fascinated with Norway's experience in the war, with Nansen and his background, with how concentration camps were operated. And as I was gathering all this information, I thought to myself, if I had only known all of this information when I first read this diary, it would have made even that much more sense to me. And so I decided that rather than just take this old 1949 copy, essentially get it retyped and, and republished, that I would become the editor of this and the annotator of it. I would try to help explain to readers, especially American readers now, not so much no Norwegians, explain the who, the what, the where, the when. Who are these people that Nansen is in prison with? I mean, they don't, these names don't resonate in, to American audiences. So when Nansen is talking, he's standing at a roll call one day, and he strikes up a conversation with a young man named Einar Gerhardsen. Doesn't mean much to Americans, didn't mean anything to me, but of course, you know, he was your prime minister after the war. When Nansen talks about his friend Per Krog, the painter, again, name meant nothing to me, but once I started researching it, I learned all sorts of interesting things about Per Krog, including the fact that after the war, he painted the mural that adorns the UN Security Council chamber, in uh, New York City. I didn't realize until I checked into the Hotel Glanda uh, just yesterday that there are obviously the murals in the walls that he painted. So I was taking photographs of everything this morning there. So this is the kind of information that I've added by way of footnotes and by way of an extensive introduction to this book. And I tell people, you can ignore everything I've added to this book. Just read Nonsense Diary. That's how I read it and I fell in love with it. But if you want to know more, I've made it available to you by way of introductions and by way of footnotes. So what I'd like to do with you this afternoon, well, quite frankly, what I'd like to do is read the whole book to you, but I, I don't think you'll stand for that because it might take us about three or four weeks. But what I'd like to do at least is give you a flavor of what it was in this diary that captured me the way it did. And hopefully you'll come away with an appreciation for how special I think this book is. And hopefully, even more importantly, you'll come away with an appreciation for what a remarkable man Odd Nansen was. Because I really think, in retrospect, that it was my admiration for him that kept me going for those six years of trying to find a publisher and getting rejection after rejection after rejection. And I guess I should to note here, the way I found a publisher, the University of, 
of uh, Vanderbilt, uh, Vanderbilt University Press, was I gave a presentation in 2014 to a group in Nashville, Tennessee called the Sons of Norway. There are millions of Sons of Norway chapters in the uh, United States. And at the end of it, at that point, I said to people, I'm, I'm still looking for a publisher, I still have proposals, but nothing definite, and I'll, you know, keep you posted. And a gentleman walked up to me afterwards, and he gave me his business card, he said, Tim, I will try to do anything I can do to help you find a publisher. His name was Sten Vermund, and he says, my grandfather was in Ganini. So he had a personal reason for getting me introduced to the Vanderbilt University Press, and that's what it took. So let's talk about Nansen in his diary. What struck me almost from the beginning, before I'd really even gotten to the point of Googling Odd Nonsense to find out who this person was, whose diary I'm reading, what struck me was Odd Nonsense's writing ability. His ability to capture in his words the actions, the feelings, the thoughts that he's having in a way that I believe are almost Tolstoyan. I mean, it's just unbelievably eloquent. And you have to remind yourself when you're reading this book that he wrote it inside of a concentration camp, not in some beautiful library where he could look out the window and see beautiful views and decide, do I use this verb or that verb or how should I approach it? He, I mean, he's writing this furtively, knowing full well that if he's caught red-handed with this diary, he, could, he would certainly be punished. He could easily have been executed. I mean, at one point, he mentions in the diary how a Dutch prisoner is caught with a diary and he's hauled away and he's never seen again. So let me give you an example. This first example I just want to read to you, it's just, it's just kind of a random sample, t is, is from September 6, 1942. Nansen was arrested on January 13, 1942, and he was initially kept in Ganini, the uh, prison which I'm sure you're all familiar with outside of Oslo. And then in the fall of 1942, he was sent to a work camp way, way up north above the Arctic Circle to build snow shelters over some of these roads. He stayed there, the camp was called Vidal. He was there for a few months, and he came back to Ganini, and then from there, he was sent on to Sachsenhausen. So this particular diary entry, it's a Sunday afternoon. It's a sunny day, kind of like today. One of the prisoners is a minister, and he is going to conduct a church service. And because some of these barracks they're living in are just really nothing more than really small shacks, the only place they can do this for all the prisoners is to have an outdoor ceremony. Nansen isn't taking... He's not participating in the church service. What he's doing is spending his time doing what he loves to do when he has free time, and that is to sketch. He's a remarkable artist, and we're going to see copies of his sketches. And the only place that he can get perspective on this outdoor scene to back up to, to it, to get everything included in that, it happens to be right next to the outdoor latrine. And this is what he writes. September, Sunday, September 6, 1942. I sat with my back against the urinal, Per was standing by the dustbin using it as a drawing board, and that's Per Krog, the man who painted this mural. In the middle of the benediction, an impious prisoner came and started rippling on the wall behind me. And in the middle of the Lord's Prayer, a Viennese waltz, shrill and out of tune, cut in from the German hut just beyond the fence. But the congregation listened no less devoutly to the clergyman who preached no less fervently and Pear and I painted, no less imperturbably, and the sun poured down its golden rain, no less lavishly, over all of us. And perhaps the Lord himself is not so particular about the forms up here in the wilds. Now, I don't know about you, but you could lock me in a library for six months, and I don't think I could describe this outdoor church service like that. And here's his sketch of it. You can see the minister there, the sun pouring down its golden rain. You know, he uses parallelism, he uses metaphor. It's, it's an amazingly composed scene. And yet he's doing this, as I say, on the sly. So who was Ad Nansen? Now that's a big question I ask it in America. <laughs> For you, I'm going to assume most of you know a little bit about him. Here's a picture of Ad Nansen, a family photograph. And Ad is the little baby in his mother's arms in that photograph. That was taken in the spring of 1902. Nansen was born in December 1901. And as you can see from this photograph, he is the fourth child born to his mother, Eva Sars Nansen, and his father, Fritjof Nansen. I'm going to talk about some um, remarkable coincidences it, that occurrences that have occurred to me in my journey with this book. One of them is his, Nansen's older brother, Kore, ended up relocating to Canada and lived out the rest of his life there, although he came back to visit. 
about a year or two or so, I get a, a notice on Facebook from somebody who wants to be my friend, and it turns out it's Corey's granddaughter living in Canada, Jill Nansen. And I've been in touch with her ever since. But anyways, back to, to Odd Nansen. So Nansen's mother and father, Eva and Fritjof, they came from very well-to-do, prominent families in Norway. Uh, they were very accomplished themselves. They were both very artistic. His mother was both a painter and a singer. His father was a very good artist as well. Unfortunately for Odd Nansen, his mother died when he was only six years old. She contracted pneumonia in 1907, and those were days before you didn't have antibiotics. And some, you know, some people made it, some people didn't. So Nansen was pretty much raised single-handedly by his father, Fritjof Nansen. Now, he did spend some considerable time living with other families, but I mean, it was his father who was obviously still in charge. And I consider that to be both a, a blessing and a curse. Because as you know, and as I don't have to explain, Fritjof Nansen is really one of the most famous men Norway has ever produced. He's a polar explorer, first person to cross Greenland from coast to coast. He goes to the North Pole in the Fram, which is just down the road here. Doesn't make it to the North Pole, but he goes farther north than any human being had gone at that point. That record stands for a number of years. When he's leading that expedition, he's 31 years old. Now, I have a 35-year-old son. Sometimes you worry about whether he can figure out how to change planes at the airport. This man is responsible for the lives of a dozen people. When he's in his 40s, Fritjof Nansen becomes a statesman. He helps Norway achieve its independence in 1905. He's the person who was sent to Denmark to talk to Prince Karl of Denmark to convince him to become the king, Haakon VII. And then in his 50s, Fritjof Nansen becomes a humanitarian. He becomes the first high commissioner of refugees for the League of Nations. He does such a good job repatriating POWs, helping with famine relief in Russia, uh, arbitrating between Turkey and Greece in a border dispute, just a number of things. He is awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, as I'm sure you all know, in 1922. So I tell people, at least in America, the analogy I say is, imagine having a father who is as famous as Lewis and Clark, Abraham Lincoln, and Martin Luther King, all wrapped up in one personality. And in a country like Norway that had a population then of about three million people, it's pretty tough to kind of uh, stay under the radar when your father is that famous. So as I mentioned before, Nansen is born in 1901 on December 6th. In 1927, he graduates from college with a degree in architecture because he's very artistic like his parents were. He marries his sweetheart, Hadi Hirsch, and he immediately leaves Norway, comes to America. And I'm sure he had a lot of different motivations for doing that, but I personally think probably one of the greatest motivations is he just wanted to get out from under his father's shadow. You know, he wanted to go to a place where he would be known for his, for his own work. In fact, I found a copy, he, Nansen visited the United States in 1939 to help raise awareness of the plight of Finland during the Winter War in 1939. And the headline of the, the lead-in to the New York Times says, Fritjof, uh, Ad Nansen, comma, the son of the famous Fritjof Nansen, comma, arrived in New York City yesterday. I mean, he was always going to be kind of secondhand. So Nansen lives in New York City for a number of years, practices as an architect, and he's a very successful architect. He enters a contest where there are 254 entries, and he wins third place when he's only 29 years old. So he was definitely a skilled architect. And of course, you know, he designed most of the terminals at the Fornebu airport. In 1930, he gets word that his father, Fritjof Nansen, is not doing well. He's ill, and he's starting to fail. So Nansen takes his wife, uh, Kari, and his newborn child, Marit, uh, back to America. In fact, I think if you talk to Marit long enough, I think you can still detect a little bit of a Brooklyn accent in her, because so, she was born in Brooklyn. So he comes back to Norway, and he arrives in time to say his goodbyes to his father, who dies on May 13th, 1930. And Nansen decides at that point, you know, I don't have to go back to America. I can live in Norway now. And again, I think it's because this larger-than-life competing figure is not there. And I think if we could go back in a time machine to 1930 and interview Odd Nansen and ask him, well, Mr. Nansen, how do, you, how do you see your career path going now that you've come back to Norway? I think he probably would have said something like this. Everything looks great. I mean, life is good, as that saying goes. You know, I've gotten some great work experience in, in America. I want to start my own architectural firm here in Norway. I've had my first child. I want to have more children. I'm back in Oslo with my people I went to school with, my neighbors. Everything looks great. 
But of course, we know that the storm clouds are already beginning to form over Europe. January 1933, Hitler seizes power in Germany, starts persecuting the Jews, as well as the Social Democrats and the Communists. Many of these Jews flee to Austria. Germany annexes Austria. Many of them flee to Czechoslovakia. In fact, Tommy Bergenthal was born in Czechoslovakia of parents who had fled Germany, figuring we'll stay here until this madness in Germany blows over. And of course, we know how that turned out. So these, these refugees in Central Europe are, are really stuck. They have no place to go. They can't move because they have no valid passports. Their passports, for the most part, have expired at this point, And they can't get new passports, both because to do that would require you to go back to Germany, which these people are not prepared to do. And number two, even if they were willing to take that chance, to get your passport, you have to be a citizen. And under the Nuremberg Laws, the Jews have been denaturalized. They're not even considered citizens of Germany anymore. So a number of prominent people come to, to Nansen, and they say, there's a humanitarian crisis a brewing in Europe, and something's got to be done about it. And we've all decided you're the person to do something about it. I mean, your name is Nansen, after all. So Nansen, you know, with, with, which is not an easy decision, he puts his career on hold, he puts his family on hold, and in 1936, he forms Nansen Yelpen, Nansen Relief, as Frode mentioned earlier, to try to help these refugees, primarily Jewish refugees, but not exclusively, to come to Norway. And it was an uphill battle. The Norwegian government was very anti-Semitic. They were not interested in allowing Jews into the country. And that was no different than almost the governments of all the Western countries, France, Great Britain. Certainly America was very anti-Semitic at the time. They felt bad for what was happening to the Jews. They, they sympathized, but that didn't mean they wanted to change their immigration laws to allow these people to come in. So notwithstanding all the effort that Nansen put in, he was successful, as Frode mentioned earlier, in bringing about 260 men, women, and children before the war breaks out and ends his efforts. So just to kind of summarize, we know that Nansen is famous. The Nansen name is still famous. We know that he's educated. He's got a college degree in the 1920s when not that many people went to college. He's artistic. We've seen one of his sketches already. We'll see some more of them. He's a humanitarian. He's following in his father's footsteps by forming Nansen Yelpen. And Nansen also had a pretty wicked sense of humor. And that shows up in the diary. And it seems rather strange to be talking about humor in a concentration camp diary. I mean, th those don't seem to go together. But I think Nansen used humor as a kind of a coping mechanism to ward off some of the horrors that he was experiencing. I don't know if any of you are familiar with a man named Viktor Frankl. He was a Holocaust survivor, and he wrote a book after the war called Man's Search for Meaning. And in that book, he says, humor was another of the soul's weapons in the fight for self-preservation. So let me kind of give you a couple examples of Nansen's humor. His wit, and some of it is actually so dry and so subtle that I think if you read the diary too quickly, too literally, you're almost liable to miss the point. It's liable to kind of go right over your head. So let me share with you a couple of excerpts. This first one is from January 16th, 1942. Nansen was arrested three days before, and he's talking about turning in his civilian clothes and getting his prison uniform issued to him. And he writes, Trousers and a jacket, a shirt, and a pair of boots were issued to us today by Henning Botker, who was in charge of the wardrobe. The jacket, the shirt, and the trousers were too small for me, and the boots unwearable. Everything else is all right. <laughs> or on June 12, 1942, where he says, My rheumatism is bothering me. It hurts to sit, and it hurts to stand, and there is an infernal draft everywhere except in my bunk, where there's a draft too. <laughs> and finally, my favorite, one of my favorite excerpts from this entire diary, it's from the summer of 1944, and Nansen is now in Sachsenhausen, and he's talking about how this German guard sits in their work squad. They call their work squads commandos, and how this German guard basically sits there to keep an eye on, on the prisoners, make sure they're doing what they're supposed to do. And he writes, this is June 8th, 1944. The Unterscharfuhrer in this commando, and the Unterscharfuhrer would be the equivalent, at least in the US Army, of about a sergeant. I'm assuming it's kind of equivalent in Norway. Who shares my cubicle all day, thinks exclusively and all the time about girls and unfaithfulness. Last night, one of his wenches wrote on his cigarette case, in English, the words, I love you. He had no idea what they meant, so he asked me this morning. I told him they meant, kiss my arse. <laughs> His jaw dropped notably, and I let it drop. 
Well, why did Nansen write the diary in the first place? Well, number one, Nansen was kind of an inveterate diarist, really, his entire life. In fact, Mard has shared with me some of the diaries that started when he was a teenager. And he wrote, he'd been keeping a diary pretty much all his life, so it was kind of natural. He says in his introduction, he says, I never wrote this in the camps with the idea that I was ever going to publish it. So I really did it for two reasons. I did it for myself, number one. In fact, he says, writing in his diary was, quote, like confiding in a close friend in relieving my mind of all that weighed on it. It became a private manner of forgetting. So I think as long as Nansen could put down on words what, was, what he was experiencing, he didn't have to keep mentally revisiting it. Somebody told me a great analogy recently, and they said, you know, when you go shopping, you write down your, your grocery list, and once you've written it down, you forget about it. You don't try to keep in your mind all the different things you need to buy because it's, it's already written down at that point. He said, the other reason why I wrote this diary was for my wife, Cotty. I wanted her to know what was really going on in these camps that I was in. Now, he could write her letters. She could write him letters occasionally. But every letter in and out of the camp was censored. Somebody was reading everything they wrote. She could occasionally come visit him. She could get permission from the Gestapo, at least while he was a prisoner in Gnini nearby. But those prison visits were limited to 10 or 15 minutes. They could not touch each other. They had to talk over a barrier. And uh, the, there was always a guard in the room who could speak Norwegian. So what can you tell your spouse in a situation like that? And here, here's Nansen's sketch called The Visit. You know, there he is. There's uh, uh, Kadi, and I assume this is Madith right here. Um, and the guard is putting up his hand saying either don't get any closer or time's up, whatever it might be. So the diary became his way of really communicating to her what was really going on in these camps. And as you can imagine, for a man who misses his family, he writes about her in the diary continuously. In fact, he's almost obsessed with Cotty. I mean, he worries about her. Is she going to be okay? Uh, she, was, she promised me she was going to visit me this week, and then she didn't. What's wrong? Is there a problem? He finds out, soonly, sh uh, shortly after he's arrested, he finds out she's uh, pregnant with her fourth child, so he's worrying about her pregnancy at that point. And so he, he spends a lot of his time in his diary writing about her. So let me share with you a couple of excerpts. This first one's from May 23rd, 1942. When Nansen's writing this particular diary entry, he is in solitary confinement. He was being punished by the Germans because they caught him writing a poem which they thought was seditious because it was anti-German. So they put him in solitary confinement and he writes, I wonder where Kadi is today. Is she sitting alone as well? She may be unhappy for my sake. She must have heard by now that I'm, in quotation marks, inside, meeting him in solitary. But I'm writing, dear Kari, soon all these horrors will be over and we shall live together again and be happy. I can't do anything without you, not even be in prison. Now, when he writes those words, soon we'll be together, soon we'll be happy, everything's going to be great, he's been in prison for all of four months. What he doesn't know when he writes that, but we know in retrospect, is it would take another 35 months before he finally gets reunited with his wife. So compare the tone of that diary entry, which was so hopeful, so optimistic, with one that he writes two years later, on August 27, 1944, which happens to be the day of their wedding anniversary. And he writes, Today is our wedding day, 17 years. The third wedding day in prison. So in a way, that only makes 14. But 14 bright, rich years that have made it possible to get through these three dark ones. Life has been good to us after all. The wealth it has given us these 17 years, no one can take from us. It is of eternity and will never die, even though we should never meet again. So you can see where he's beginning to contemplate. He just may never get out of this camp alive. As I said, the war just seems to go on interminably. Here it is, the summer of 1944, and it's more intense than ever. It's not winding down. Um, so um, you can see where uh, you know, he's, he's uh, fascinated and, and obsessed with writing about her, and, and he realizes that the longer you stay in these camps, the greater your chances of something bad happening to you. You know, you can take care of yourself, but you can still succumb to an infectious disease like typhus that's prevalent whenever you have overcrowding. And by January 1945, the camp is bursting at the seams. These, these barracks have way more prisoners than, than they were built for. And if Nansen were ever to get on the wrong side of a guard, 
the guard takes a shot on him and kills him, no one would even ask the guard to explain it. I mean, they don't have to justify what they do. Their only law in the camp is what the guard says it is. And every prisoner is expendable. So you can see that kind of showing up in, in nonsense um, uh, attitude there. So why was Nansen arrested in the first place? Well, he was arrested primarily in retaliation for two British commando raids that were launched against the coastline of Norway in late December 1941, Operation Anklet and Operation Archery. And this drove the German overlord of Norway, the Reichskommissar Joseph Terboven, insane that the British could pull this off, attack these uh, fish oil processing plants, blow them up, shoot and, and kill a number of German soldiers, and then get away with it, take off back to England. So he decided, the way I'm going to get back at the British, and I think it, almost more importantly, his ulterior motive was the get, way to get back at the royal family that is living in exile in Great Britain and in America, is I'm going to order the arrest of 20 hostages who have some connection with the royal family. And I'm just going to hold them as an insurance policy. And Adnanson, of course, was a prime example. He was kind of example A1. He's a prominent man. It's his father who brought the king over from Denmark back in 1905. So he's arrested along with the royal physician, the royal chamberlain, a number of other prominent people. They're never charged with a crime. They're never sentenced to anything. They're just kind of held on. But I think the other reason why Nansen ended up in prison, and the reason why I think he stayed in prison, was because he was a bitter enemy of the man who lived in this house, Viking Quisling. They had clashed for a number of years. Nansen would interrupt his speeches. Nansen came to one time, had a, a, an audience with Quisling, and told him Quisling to stop using his father's name, Fritjof Nansen, in his speeches. So they were, they were bitter enemies. And of those 20 hostages that were arrested in early January 1942, over the course of the war, 19 of them were released for various reasons. The only person who never got out was Odd Nansen. And I have no documentary proof, maybe Freud I can find some, but I think it was Quisling who just kind of made, kept his finger on the scales to make sure this man never got free. It was his way of getting his revenge. But I think as you read this diary and you get to know the personality of Odd Nansen, I think you almost have to come to the conclusion that even if the British had never attacked Norway in a commando raid, and even if Quisling had never existed, had never been born in the first place, that Nansen was going to end up in prison one way or the other. You know, he was just one of these people who had a personality where he's going to do what he thinks the right thing to do is. It's almost to hell with the consequences. And of course, you know that the number of ways to get in trouble in occupied Norway were legion. You know, singing the national anthem, you get you arrested. Owning a radio, you get you arrested. Listening to the BBC could get you shot. Trying to escape to England could get you shot. Refusing to sit next to a soldier on a bus or the trolley could get you arrested. We're, you know, the, the, the list of infractions went on and on and on. And Nansen was one of these people. He's kind of like his father. You know, he's a little bit stiff-necked in the sense of, I'm going to do what's right, and I'm not going to kind of trim my sails as a result. And I, I'm going to read you a diary entry, which I think kind of embodies what I think is is Nansen's philosophy. And in this particular diary entry, Nansen is talking about the Blockaltester in his barracks. Blockaltester is a German word. It means barracks leader. The Blockaltester was a prisoner, almost invariably a German prisoner, who was appointed and delegated the authority by the Nazi guards to keep order and discipline within each particular barracks. And because these people got their, their, their authority from the Nazis, most of these block altars tended to be as sadistic and as mean and as vicious as the Nazis were, if not more so. They tried to outdo them because they knew that's the only way they could keep their jobs. But Nansen says in his particular barracks, the, the, the block altar, his name is Ludwig, was actually a pretty decent guy. He said Ludwig wouldn't hurt a fly. Then he goes on to say this. Ludwig is one of the few who helped to preserve something in oneself which must not be lost. For it is not only the corpses of human beings which are burned and annihilated here. It's not only the young, strong bodies which have turned into musulmen, skeletons, and crematorium fuel. On this battlefield, the young faith and enthusiasm of thousands has gone under. The vital spark of thousands has been quenched in darkness and in brutishness. Ideals have vanished. Human kindness has turned to ice in many a heart. Faith in the future, the will in the force of good, have withered up as the muscles wither up to useless dry tissue 
in the skeleton bodies of the Muslim And then he adds this one final sentence, which to me is the kicker. He says, of all the mass murders, perhaps this is the worst. Now here's somebody who sees death and destruction on a daily basis, who writes in his diary about how he has to straddle over a dead body to get into the urinal. And yet he's saying that when human kindness shrivels up, when ideals vanish, that's the worst crime that's being committed against these people. And I've pondered that sentence ever since I read it nine years ago. And I'm still not 100% sure I know what Nancy was trying to get at. But I, I recently heard uh, an interview on National Public Radio back in the United States. And it was a woman named uh, Esther Perel. And she is a psycho, um, psychoanalyst. And she's the daughter of two Holocaust survivors. In fact, both her mother and father were the only survivors in their respective families. And so she knew a lot about the survivor um, community. And she said they really broke down into two, two groups. There were those people who, after the war, went on living, and there were those people who did not die. And I think that's a distinction. I mean, just staying alive, but if you're incapable of having empathy, if you're incapable of trusting anyone anymore, what's the point of staying alive? And I think this is what Nancy was getting at. If you don't keep your humanity, just being alive is, is worth nothing. And to destroy that humanity, even if you physically are alive, is, just not, is the worst crime that can, be, that can occur. Now, I used another German word in that excerpt that I read to you. In fact, I used it twice. The word was Muselmen. Muselmen is a German word which means Muslim in English. And for reasons that no one's quite sure of, even to this day, although I think there's a number of different theories, the term Muslim was given to those prisoners in these concentration camps who were so enervated, so emaciated, that they literally had one foot in the grave. You know, people whose lifespan was measured in days, if not in hours. And this is nonsense sketch of a Muslim. I think when we see that picture, that kind of conjures up the quintessential idea of what we think of a, as a concentration camp prisoner. In fact, that's his, his own handwriting on Muslim done in Sachsenhausen, November 1944. Now, who made up the majority of the Muslim in these camps? It was the Jews, of course. The Jews had the worst of everything. Now, they weren't the only people who were brutalized in these camps. The Ukrainians, the Russians, the Poles were treated horribly as well because in that racial hierarchy that I mentioned earlier, the Germans put the East, Euro East European Slavic race really just one step ahead of the, of the Jews. But despite that, as I said, the Jews had the worst of everything. You know, as Elie Wiesel has said, Although not all victims were Jews, all Jews were victims. And I think that's a distinction we've got to keep in mind. And whereas almost all the other prisoners in these camps would treat the Jewish prisoners as pariahs, as people to stay as far away from as possible, nothing good could come to you associating with a Jew inside of a concentration camp, unless you want to get a beating as well. And yet Nansen would go to the Jewish barracks. He would meet these people. He would say to them, what, where did you come from? What's your story? How did you get into this camp? What camp did you come from? What was it like there? That's how he learned about Auschwitz and, and places like that. And many of these Jews would say to him, we know we'll never get out of this place alive. I mean, we know the score. The Germans are not going to let us live no matter how this war ends out, uh, turns out, good or bad. So you have to be the person who tells our stories for us. And Nansen uses his diary as a way of sharing these stories. In fact, uh, to me, one of the, one of the most important things about this diary, it's an eyewitness account of the Holocaust as it's occurring in real time. Nansen talks about, for instance, a, a Jewish builder from Budapest that he meets. And this man explains to him how he was captured in Yugoslavia and marched from Yugoslavia all the way to Sachsenhausen, a march of 500 miles. I don't know how many kilometers that is, but it's a lot. And it starts with 3,000 men and ends up with 850 actually walking into the camp alive. And this is what Nansen writes about this Jewish builder in one of his diary entries. This one is from December 18th, 1944. He says, there's one touching detail I must relate about this man. I've given him a few clothes and some cigarettes and some food. He was very anxious to show his gratitude. One day he came to me with a little thing that he wanted to give me as a souvenir, and I had to promise to keep it. It was, he said, the best Thing he owned. He had nothing else. It was one of the cigarettes that he had borrowed from me 
now neatly wrapped up in silver paper. I had given him only three that time. I was in rather low water myself. After the war, he added, he would give me the same present in gold and precious stones. Now, why would somebody make such an extravagant offer like that? I tend to think that he was certainly grateful for the food that Nansen was giving him, the clothing Nansen was giving him, but I think he was showing his gratitude for something else that Nansen was giving him that was more valuable because it was actually more scarce in these concentration camps. And that was the gift of friendship, you know, the gift of empathy, the gift of listening. You know, most prisoners are probably saying, look, don't tell me your story. I I've got enough problems of my own trying to get through this, this crucible. Nansen wasn't like that. He was, I say, outer directed. He wanted to hear these stories. So how did Nansen preserve and get this diary out of these camps so that he could publish it? Again, keeping a diary is a very dangerous undertaking. Well, Nansen says, you know, writing the diary proved not to be too difficult for him because much like his father, Fritjof Nansen, Nansen had this capacity to get almost no sleep, a few hours at night, and then get up the next morning and go back to work. Now, admittedly, he had easier jobs than many of the prisoners. He didn't have hard physical labor for the most part because, number one, the Germans knew he was a hostage. That was a different, you know, different triangle, not a political prisoner, not a resistance fighter. He was famous. They knew who Nansen was, uh, and he was you know, educated. But still, he could stay up till 2, 3 o'clock in the morning writing his diary while everybody else is sound asleep in the uh, barracks and then get up at 4.30, 5.30 and get back to work. In fact, many of his diary entries end with the words, you know, it's now 2.30 in the morning. I better stop writing for tonight. I'll pick it up tomorrow. Nansen could hide the diary. He says, I would put it in the one place, the pages as I wrote them, in the one place I knew the Germans would never go look for them. And that was in the latrine. They weren't going into the latrine if they could help it. To them, that was just a cesspool of infectious bacteria. And so he knew he was relatively safe. So the question was, how do you get it out of the camp? Well, for 18 months, or, or more or less, Nansen was a prisoner in Gnini and in, in Vidal. And who's the only people coming into the camp to deliver food, construction material? Who are the old tradesmen who are coming into the camp? They're fellow Norwegians. These are his, his friends, his neighbors. And so they were all willing to help the prisoners smuggle something out. I mean, everybody was, in, was involved in the smuggling business. In fact, some of the German guards, some of the drivers themselves were helping smuggle some of this stuff out. As long as they got enough cigarettes, They'd be willing to smuggle notes and cards. So everybody was doing this. In Nansen's case, what he was smuggling out for his wife, Kari, were the pages of the diary. Then in the fall of 1943, he gets in trouble. Actually, in August of 1943, he gets in trouble with the commandant at Ganini. The commandant says, now I'm going to send you to a real concentration camp, a camp in Germany called Sachsenhausen. And you should tell your family to put up a headstone for you now, because you're not coming home from this experience. So Nansen ends up, he actually arrives in Sachsenhausen on October 6th, 1943. And he writes in the diary, he says, I don't know how I'm ever going to get the pages of this diary out of here now. I mean, there's nobody sympathetic to me on the outside. I can't bribe anybody. I'm in the middle of enemy territory. But psychologically, it's so important to me to keep writing this diary that I'm just going to keep going, hoping that I think of some way to get this, save this diary and smuggle it out. And if I can't, if I can't think of any way, assuming the war ends and I'm still alive, rather than lose all this, I will bury it in the ground. And parts of diaries have been found buried in the ground, primarily in Auschwitz, members of the Sonderkommando. So there are other people who were kind of thinking the same thought press. They wanted to preserve what they had, they didn't want to destroy all this work they had put into this. But then Nansen says, I had to finally had a, had a brainstorm. And I realized that when these prisoners would often go on transports, they would take with them what they called a breadboard, a piece of wood about this big. And that would be the, the surface that you would eat your, your bread ration off. That would be kind of a work surface for you. And because many of the prisoners had these breadboards, nobody paid much attention to them. I mean, they were just kind of a useless piece of wood. I mean, what can you do? They're not dangerous. They're not harmful. You're not going to be able to you know, hurt somebody with this. And he says, I realized that I could take my breadboard and I could go to one of my friends who worked in the carpentry commando, who had access to tools, and have him split it open for me. And I would put the pages in the diary, glue it, seal it up, and no one would be any wiser that I was hiding it there. And so at the end of the war, he and five of his closest friends walked out of the camps with their breadboards. 
This is a picture of a real breadboard, um, and that's how they smuggled the German portion of the diary out. In fact, this particular breadboard was owned by a gentleman named Eric Magelson, and the Magelson family is in this row here today, and I've spoken to his grandson, who lives in Houston, Texas. One thing, a couple of things I'd point out to you in this picture, if you look closely, if you look a little bit at the context here, the paper that Nansen was writing on was like tissue paper, ultra thin, so you can get a lot of pages in a very small cavity. Uh, number two, it's a little bit hard to tell from this, but his writing is microscopically small. In, in real life, if you, would, if you reduce this down to this big, you can see how small that is such that when the typists went to transcribe this for publication in 1947, they needed magnifying glasses just to read what he had written. The other thing that amazes me, if you look at these two representative pages, there's not a single word crossed out. I mean, whatever I've been reading to you is basically how nonsense, he composed it before he even wrote it, so that he didn't have to revise almost anything or change his mind on uh, what he was talking about. So, this afternoon, we've We've talked about Nansen's eloquence. We began talking about that, his writing ability. We talked about his sense of humor. We've talked about his love for his wife, Kari, how much he wrote about her. We've talked about his sympathy for the plight of the Jews. And of course, this diary has its share of horror. I mean, Nansen was witness to some unbelievably horrific scenes, and he writes about them, again, very graphically in this diary. But to me, the, the power of this diary is certainly not in its horror. If, if this diary had just been a catalog of one horror after another, I wouldn't have spent six years of my life trying to get it back into print. To me, the power of this diary is, is the power of Nansen's example. The example of a man who somehow keeps his humanity in the most inhumane conditions mankind has ever created. You know, Nansen could have walked right by Tom Bergenthal. He could have ignored him like every other person could, did. He could have thought to himself, what can a, an injured 10-year-old Jewish boy possibly do to help me. But that's not how Nansen thought about this. He intervened and he helped Tommy. And since I began my story earlier this afternoon talking about the story of Tom Bergenthal, let me kind of come full circle, tell you what ultimately became of him. Tommy was liberated. He survived to the end of the war. He was liberated on April 22nd, 1945. His mother survived in another camp called Ravensbrück, a woman's camp in Germany. His father did not survive the war. He died in another concentration camp called Buchenwald, of pneumonia in January 1945, just months before the war ended. And it would take Tommy and his mother another year and a half, 18 more months after the war ends, to even find each other. They, they have no idea where, the, where they are. His mother doesn't know where he is. He doesn't know where she is. Europe is devastated at that point. There's no communications. So really, it's a whole, I know it's a whole other chapter in their lives is how they reunite. But she, Tommy's mother finally finds him in an orphanage outside of Warsaw. She takes him back to Germany to live with her, because that's where she grew up. Now, you have to remember, until Tommy has been liberated, he is completely illiterate. He's 11 years old. He has never been in a classroom in his entire life, can't read or write. In fact, Nansen writes in his diary, he says, I, I asked him one time, why don't your parents teach you how to read and write? You didn't have to go to school for that. And his answer is, in the KLC ghetto, which is where they were first incarcerated, it was a capital crime for Jewish parents to teach their children how to read and write. My parents could have been shot for doing that. So this kid's had no education at all, nothing, other than the school of hard knocks. So his mother takes him back to Germany. She hires a tutor. She says to the tutor, I want you to teach my son in one year everything that he should have learned in grades one through seven. So at the end of that one year, I can put him in the eighth grade, which is the grade that he would have been in had he been in school like a normal child. So he, he has uh, one year of tutoring. He enters the eighth grade, ninth grade, 10th grade. He starts the 11th grade. By this time, he's a young teenager. And he decides he doesn't want to grow up and live in Germany for reasons I think we can all fully understand. And he has an aunt and uncle who live in New Jersey. So he decides to emigrate to the United States. Comes to America. He arrives in January 1953. And his aunt and uncle take him down to the local high school in the middle of the school year, sign him up. And they said, well, you know, based on your age, young man, you're now what we call a junior, a third year student in high school. So at this point, Tommy's had three and a half years of any education at all, three and a half years of English instruction. He never spoke any English before the war. He was only fluent in German and Polish. He finishes high school in New Jersey. He goes to a small college in West Virginia. And four years later, he graduates from college as the valedictorian of his class, number one student. 
He then goes to NYU Law School, New York University Law School, which is one of the best law schools in the country. He gets a legal degree. He then goes to Harvard Law School, the best law school in all of America. And he gets a master's degree and a doctorate in the field of international law and international human rights, inspired, as he said, by the example of Ad Nansen. And Tom Bergenthal goes on to have one of the most spectacularly successful careers that you can imagine. He wins every accolade, every award, every recognition that you can possibly earn in his field. And that culminates in the year 2000, when he is appointed to the International Court of Justice at The Hague. And here's a picture of Tommy in his judicial robes. Now, one of the completely unforeseen and unexpected benefits of my decision back in 2010 to get this book back into print is that in the process I've become a very close friend not only of Maritz, but of Tom Bergenthal. He is 85 years old, he's retired, he lives outside of Washington, D.C., and every time I go through Washington, I always make a point of stopping and having dinner with him and his wife. Delightful man. Now, when this diary was published in 1947, Nansen included a dedication page. And he dedicated the diary to a number of his Norwegian friends who did not survive the war. Norwegians who were either executed, murdered, died of disease, whatever. And then, in the bottom of his dedication, the last line, he says, And to you too, little Tommy, to your living memory, I dedicate this book. And when he wrote those words, he didn't even know whether Tommy had survived. He had no idea where he was at the time. And now, Tom Bergenthal, as a favor to Nansen, as a favor to me, has written a new preface for this hardcover edition, 70 years after this book was dedicated to him as a young boy. Now, to me, that's just astounding. I mean, you can't even make up a set of facts that are as amazing as that. So let me leave you with one final diary entry. I appreciate all the attention that you've given me this afternoon. To me, this diary kind of sums up everything about Nansen and, his, and, and who he is. And again, it, it's based on his relationship with Tom Bergenthal. The date of it is March 5th, 1945. Nansen has just learned that he is going to be moved from Sachsenhausen to another concentration camp, a camp called Neuengamme. This is part of the white buses operation. You may be familiar with that, where all of the Norwegians were being centrally located at Neuengamme, which is very close to the Danish border. Then they were ultimately brought over to Denmark and then into Sweden. And Tommy, and uh, Nansen rather, goes to Tommy and he says, in my three and a half years as a prisoner, this is the most difficult thing I've had to do, which is to say goodbye to you. I've thought of every possible, he's in love with Tommy. I mean, he's, he's fallen in love with him. He said, I've thought of every possible way of taking you with me. I've, I've thought of even trying to kidnap you, hide you in a burlap sack, and smuggle you into Neuengamme with me. But of course, I can't do that. So you have to promise me that you will write to me after this war ultimately ends and uh, tell me how you made out. And Tommy's response is, I'm paraphrasing here, is something along the lines of, yes, yes, of course I will do that. After all, it is my duty. And Nansen is so struck by the fact that this young boy uses this word duty. He says, he, he's trying to act like a grown-up. He's 10 years old, and he's trying to act like a grown-up. And he's probably heard this word duty used over and over and over again in these camps. So he's latched onto it. So this is what Nansen writes. And just remember, when Nansen's writing this, he doesn't know the war is going to end in eight weeks. We do. Nansen doesn't know that whether Noyangama is going to be better or worse than, than Sachsenhausen. In fact, when he gets to Noyangama, he says it's much worse there. He says, if death stalked the streets of Sachsenhausen, it galloped in Noyangama. He doesn't know whether the supply of Red Cross food parcels will keep going. At this point, the Allies are bombing everything that moves during the day. They have complete control of the air. And if he doesn't get those food parcels, he's going to end up like a Muslim man, just like every other prisoner does. And yet, with all that weighing on him, just listen to what he writes and how eloquent this is, how compassionate, how hopeful this diary entry is. And knowing what we know about what Tom's career was, which Nansen certainly couldn't have predicted when he was an 11-year-old boy, how prophetic these words are. And he writes, Little Tommy, if only your fellow creatures thought a fraction, a fraction as much about their duty to you as you do about yours to them, all your prospects would be brighter than they are today. Thank God you don't realize that, and may you never come to realize the abyss of vile injustice that has been done to you. May there be such a future in store for you that all this frightful, this unintelligible cruelty will be expunged from your mind. May you discover that life is not like that, 
The world is not as it looked to you from the floor of the cattle car when you cried because you were so terribly cold. May you one day grasp and experience its richness in all the warmth and joy, all the beaming light that are reflected in those big eyes of yours, too shrewd for a child, and which are a reminder and evidence of what you were meant to be. Thank you very much for listening to my talk. Thank you, Tim, for this interesting and touching presentation. Thank you. I think we have some minutes for questions. We have uh, two microphones in ah, the... Ah, okay. And... Uh, Any questions? I've put you all to sleep already. Okay. Yes, oh, please. we have a question in the front. Wait, wait, wait for the microphone. We have a question in the front. Thank you very much. My name is Anne Greve. Thank you for your touching uh, speech, uh, Timothy. Um, I have one question. Uh, did they actually meet again, uh, Odd Nansen and Tommy? And Tommy. Oh, good the... question. Did, did Tommy and Odd uh, Nansen uh, reunite? Well, as I mentioned, uh, Tommy did not find his mother, or his mother did not find him until December 1946. And when they are reunited, he says to his mother, explains to her, he says, Muti, the reason why I'm alive today is because this Norwegian saved my life when we were in the camp together. Unfortunately, I can no longer remember his name. I mean, he's, he's, he's illiterate, number one, so writing it down wasn't going to help him. He's, he's gone through as many experiences in those 18 months than you and I would probably go through in a lifetime. I mean, he's marching with the Polish army around the country. He's doing everything. So he's forgotten who Adnansen is. He said, the one thing I do remember is that when I was in Sachsenhausen one time, this man came to me with a cookie jar. And on the cover of the cookie jar was a picture of his father. And he kept pointing to that picture, saying how, how famous his father was in Norway. So Tommy's mother says, well, I, I guess maybe they had a cookie factory in Norway. I mean, what else, what else have we got to, you know? So that's kind of where things stand. Until 1947, when Tommy's mother reads in a refugee newspaper about how a Norwegian has just published his diary in Norway, and it's one of the best sellers in 1947. People are reading it. And that covers 18 months of his incarceration in Sachsenhausen. So Tommy's mother says, why don't you write to this man and ask him to help you find the person you're looking for? So Nansen, or Bergenthal rather, writes a, a, a letter, and it's very open-ended. You know, Dear Mr. Nansen, I understand you wrote a diary and you were in Sachsenhausen. I'm trying to find uh, a person. Maybe, in fact, it's you that I'm trying to find. I was the young boy with the amputated toes in the Riviere. And if it's not you, can you possibly try to help me find in the community who this person is who helped me? And he writes this letter, he puts it in an envelope, he addresses the envelope, Mr. Adnansen, Norway. That's it. Sends it off, and either Adnansen was as famous as we think he is, or the Norwegian post office is a really good postal service, but this, uh, this letter gets to him. And he says, uh, after I wrote the letter, I kind of forgot about it. He was a young boy, he's doing other things. And a uh, few weeks go by, and then one day, there's a knock on their apartment door. He goes to the door, and there are four Norwegian soldiers standing at the door. Where he was living was a city called Gerdingen, which was in the, German, uh, in the British occupation zone. And the British used Norwegian soldiers after the war as part of their occupation force. So these people, they ask him, is this the Bergenthal residence? He says, yes, it is. Well, he says, well we've got a package for you. He goes, these four men go to the back of this army truck and take off this enormous wooden crate. It takes four men to get it into his apartment. They bring it in, they plop it on his living room floor, they take out a crowbar, pry it open. And Tommy says, I look into this box and it's filled with chocolate and sardines and cheese and all the food you can't get in Germany after the war. They're on rationing, you know. And I understand subsequently, I think somebody's told me that most of the chocolate was donated by Norwegian children whose parents had read the diary and knew the story of Tom Bergenthal. And on the top of it, of course, was a letter written to Tommy in German 
that begins my Lieber, Lieber, Tommy, my dear Tommy. And Nansen flew down to Germany, met Tommy's mother, took him back to up here to Oslo so he could live by the fjord and get his strength back. And they remained friends and for the rest of their lives until Nansen died in June of 1973. So great question. Thank you very much. Any other questions? We have one more. Oh, now we have questions. Yeah. Hi. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Yes, thank uh, you. My name is Anna Ellingsen. And I, I wrote uh, the book, uh, which in Norwegian is called uh, Odd Nansen, Arvetageren. Kom på historie og kultur forlaget 2015. Uh, when I was writing that book, I had the pleasure of collaborating with, among others, Robert Bjerka, who is among us today. I would um, challenge you, Robert, to uh, to tell us a little bit. Can you tell us a little bit about how you felt Odd? Can you tell us a little bit about how you felt Odd? No, I think no. Um, because Robert was with with um, with Odd as yeah. a fellow um, architect, and they shared an office there. And uh, one of the things that really got to me was um, the way in which these people managed to keep their spirit high mm -hmm. uh, in in this terrible situation. Hmm. Hmm? Yeah. A little louder. Or? And the hair, yeah. And uh, and uh, Robert has told me that Odd was not the kind of guy who would. Um, he wasn't the kind who would, um, you know, be high on himself because he was the son of Fridtjof Nansen or something like that. And he said he was the only one that that uh, he saw who was actually walking around. Uh, in the camp to systematically investigate the conditions of the Jewish uh, inmates there mm -hmm. and showing empathy. Is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I can say just uh, now you got a little, a little. Now they've got a little smaky bit. Are they just following up? Now finds the two books from Odd Nansen. Question in the back. Yeah. Yes. Hello, I'm Ingrid. Hi, it's really great to listen to you. Thank you. I uh, just had like, I was a bit curious about how he came home. If you could say a little bit about that. Okay, well, in, in the white buses operation, very close to the end of the war, um, uh, uh, the man who was the acting head of the Swedish Red Cross, a man named Folk Bernadotte, uh, managed to get an audience with Himmler, Heinrich Himmler, who was in charge of the concentration camps. And Himmler was fully aware that Germany was about to go down in defeat. And I think he started thinking that despite the fact that he murdered about 10 million people, maybe he could you know, get in somebody's good graces by allowing some of the Norwegian and, Scandin and Danish prisoners to be released early. Um, there, was a, there was a controversy at the time when the war was getting to end as to what to do with these prisoners. I mean, the, the Allies knew that there was concentration camps all around uh, the country uh, that was still controlled by Germany. And the question was, do we leave them, what they call stay in place until they're liberated, or is it better to get them out of the camps? And, and there was you know, different opinions, but I think many people were afraid that the Germans were going to, in fact, kill everybody in every one of these camps. So there was some motivation to get them out early. So Falk Bernadette meets with Himmler, and at first Himmler would not agree to release them. But the first step was, he says, I will allow all the Norwegian prisoners to be moved to one camp near the Danish border. And the, the means of doing this is the, uh, uh, I think the Danish Red Cross painted their buses white, and they put the flag, it may have been the Swedish, I think, actually, they put the Swedish flag on the top so that they wouldn't be shot at by the Allies. So everybody was brought to uh, Neuengamme from all these different camps. That's another whole story in and of itself. Then uh, Falk Bernadette met with him again, and he said, why don't you let me move them into Denmark? So they moved them into Denmark. And then on, I think it's uh, May 20, or, uh, April 22nd, 21st, 22nd, he allowed them to be moved into Sweden. And that's where Nansen's diary ends. He says, I, I, I almost can't believe it. I, I, I'm without words. Here's a man who was so unbelievably eloquent. 
And he says, I'm baffled. You know, I, I'm, I'm at a loss for words. I'm finally free after all this. And I think Marit has told me, well, one of the things he mentions is when he was in Sweden, he wanted to call his wife, but he couldn't remember his phone number. So, you know, Tommy forgets Nansen's name, Nansen forgets his own telephone number, having been in prison for over three and a half years. And I think, uh, I think it was actually Cardi learned that he was free by listening to the radio before she actually heard from him. And then he ended up uh, being reunited in um, about, I think it was July of 1945. He was stayed for a while in, uh, in Sweden. And in the book, there was a great photograph in the back. It's not in the book because we didn't want to put photographs that were not in the diary. I've added it as a gallery at the end. And one of them is a picture taken of Adnansen the day he arrived back in Oslo. And he's got his admiring children looking at him and Kari. In fact, that picture of Kari that I took is really just kind of a cropped picture of the whole family. And of course, Marit's in it as well. Um, and then he went back to you know, picking up his, his architectural practice, but he also remained active in humanitarian affairs. He worked for UNESCO. He was a special assistant to the president of UNESCO. He was part of the One World Organization for a number of years. So he kept his foot in the humanitarian world as well. Thank you for that question. Okay. No more question? Just the one last one, I think. We have a lady here. Yeah. Her husband. Yeah. yeah, we have a lady here, and her husband was came from Saxonhausen, and he came home with the white buses. Okay. Like ah. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for coming. I am honored to see you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Min min man sat sammen med Ottnansen i Saxonhausen, and uh, han kom hjem med the white buses. Together, uh -huh. yes. oh, okay. and I come to nine gamma, and then mm -hmm. to to Denmark, yes. and then to Sweden before yes. the war was finished. Ah, oh, yes, exactly. <laughs> like Thank you. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it. And what was his name? What was his? Fjell. Bjorn Fjell. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well. Thank you very much. Before you leave, uh, Corey has some very important information to give you because this arrangement is not quite finished. There will be some uh, thing afterwards. Well, I think the most important uh, before those words is to give a present oh, yes. to Timothy. Yes. Uh, yes. Oh. This is a book uh, we'll give you from the Norway Resistance Museum. Okay. It's Thanks a lot so of much. photos from the Oslo. Ah. So you don't have to uh, understand all the <laughs> text in I it, it's because it's I a lot of pictures. pictures. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. We did not know that you were going to mention the, the Red Cross uh, parcels, but oh. since you did, ah. I think this makes this gift even better. Oh, okay. And perhaps uh, they were also included in the parcel to Tommy. Ah. It's uh, Selbuvotter, Selbu uh, gloves, uh -huh. you know, the very typical knitted Norwegian gloves. Okay. We are so impressed by all your work and this presentation today that it would make us all, and I'm sure we all agree, that we would be very happy if you would wear these Norwegian gloves and, and look, not today, <laughs> but when it gets colder, yes. and uh, look and feel a little like well, thank a, you. a Norwegian. Thank mm. you so much. It's very thoughtful yeah. of you. And also we have a book written by one of our researchers, ah. Essays on the History of Jews in Estonia. Yeah. It's a quite a new book. Thank you so much. That's for you. I appreciate okay. that. Thank you. Since this is a very special occasion, we have the pleasure of inviting all of you, and I hope many of you have the time and would like to spend some more time with us, with Timothy and us, uh, downstairs. You walk downstairs and there will be refreshments, something to drink and to eat, and of course, uh, there you can buy the book. Actually, you would have to buy the book at the reception, and then Timothy will sign the book um, where we have the drinks. Um, unfortunately, uh, by mistake, the printer in England, who was supposed to uh, send 
actually 70 copies of the book, which uh, they were supposed to arrive uh, earlier this week, and they didn't. But they are on their way, and uh, we have organized it this way that you can all, if we, you know, the, you can write your names on the envelopes. It's all there, and we have stickers, and uh, Timothy will sign them, and then in a few days we'll send you the book. And we hope, uh, and I feel I will definitely buy one, oh, and right. I hope that there many of you one. <laughs> also now would very much like to read this book. Yes. So welcome. Uh, can I uh, can I follow up with that? With yes. just one final point, which is when I was when I learned the story of Adnanson, I learned how generous his, his grandfather or his own father Fritjof was. When he uh, received the Nobel Peace Prize, he gave away a vast, uh, a large portion of the cash portion of the Nobel Peace Prize to help Russian farms. This was during the Russian famine. I also learned that you saw that footnote when Nansen's diary was translated into English and German. Nansen gave away all the royalties for the sale of the German translation to German refugees after the war. I mean, here's somebody who's been brutalized for three and a half years, but he said they need it more than, than we do. And if we don't help Germany to recover, we'll be fight, fighting another cycle of hate in another generation. So I vowed that if I was ever to get this book back into print, that I would try to follow in the footsteps of Fritjof and Adnansen and give away the royalties from the sale of, of this book to organizations that if Nansen were alive today, I think he would have supported. And so with consultation with Marit, we decided that 50% of the royalties go to the US Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC, and the other 50% come here to HL Centeret. And I think that amounts already today to about 90,000 kroner. So, thank you. <laughs>